Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya, Om Shanti 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 Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace. Riviyat Swami Supernananda Ji Maharaj, dear Swami Medhananda Ji, respected Professor Chakravarti, very eminent philosophers gathered here from across the world, revered monks, uh, dear friends. It's wonderful to be here. It's one of my favorite places, the Institute of uh, Culture, especially the library here. Whenever I get an opportunity, I uh, you know, I rush to the stacks there and spend time, most time, time browsing rather than reading. Now, I'm right now in New York, in the Vedanta Society of New York, the first uh, Vedanta Society, in fact, the first ashram started in the West, started by Swami Vivekananda in 1894. New York also boasts wonderful uh, educational institutions, New York University is there, Columbia University is there. New York University has a wonderful department of philosophy, of Western analytic philosophy, especially philosophy of mind. And I realized this about five or six years ago when I just went to attend a seminar there and I saw these uh, philosophers, when they were introduced, I realized th those who were sitting next to each other, I had actually seen their books up there in the stack next to each other, you know. So <laughs> there they were stacked next to each other uh, on, on the podium there. Among them, one of the most well-known across the world, outside, uh, even outside philosophy circles, is David Chalmers. And he is known especially for one thing. Uh, that is the term, the phrase, the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness. So. This is, a, this is a term you might keep hearing again and again throughout this uh, seminar over the next few days. And this is where I would like to enter into the subject, why spirituality is re-emerging in philosophy at this juncture. Consciousness is central. Consciousness is central. Um, recently, Oxford University Press, a few years ago, they published five great unsolved questions in philosophy. Bit of an oxymoron, I think most questions in philosophy tend to remain unsolved. That's what is bread and butter for many of our other colleagues here. <laughs> but, uh, but what struck me was the very nature of these questions. What are the most important questions in philosophy according to Oxford University Press? Listen to the questions. Is there free will? One. Second question was, can we know anything at all? A question about skepticism, knowledge. Third question was, who am I? Yeah. What is the self? The fourth question in that list was, what is death? Death not in the physical uh, sense, physiological sense, but in the sense of the death of the self. And then there was one more question, uh, can there be global justice? But what struck me was, out of these five questions, the first four questions were directly related to consciousness. Just think about it. Free will, knowledge, self, death, even global justice in a sort of, sort of distant um, cousin of this subject of consciousness. So consciousness is so central to philosophy. It struck me rather late in the day that, you know, in philosophy, so the, the professional philosophers here will have to bear with me. I can almost feel them rolling their eyes. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but for the rest of us, in philosophy, the three broad areas of philosophy are, you know, what is real? Is the world real? Is God real? Is Brahman real? Am I real? What is real? So that's one, one branch of philosophy. And we call it metaphysics. A fancy new name is ontology, which comes from being. What is real? The second question you ask in philosophy, the second big branch of philosophy, is how do you know anything? 
Let me say God is real. If you say Brahman is real, the world is false, the question should be, how do you know? How do you know this? So the question of knowledge, and naturally it comes. Whenever we make any claim about the world, the self, about God, question of how do you know? So ep that's called epistemology. That's the second big branch of philosophy. And then there is one more branch of philosophy, what used to be under different heads, you know, uh, aesthetics and morals and uh, all these things, uh, the values, they've all been clubbed together broadly under a term. Now it's called axiology. So three, three big questions in philosophy. What is real? How do you know anything? And what's the point of it? What's the meaning of it? What's the purpose of it? What should we do? So these three big questions. And it struck me rather late in the day, from the Advaita Vedanta perspective at least, there is one answer to all of these questions. What is real? Brahman. Existence itself. How do you know anything? Brahman as consciousness, Chaitanya. What is the point of it all? What is the meaning, purpose, value in life? Ananda. Brahman as Ananda, bliss itself. So Advaita Vedanta gives this one answer to all these central questions or branches of philosophy. And you can see Brahman as pure consciousness is central to all of this. Even the theme of the, of the seminar we have got today, if you look at it, consciousness, perception, value, uh, reality, all of these sort of revolve around this consciousness. So consciousness is very, very central. And it has become more central recently, in the last couple of decades, 20, 30 years, for a number of reasons. Suddenly there is an upsurge of interest in consciousness studies. Um, I remember I attended, a, um, I think Professor Chakravarti was also there, uh, uh, Arindam Chakravarti, a debate, David Chalmers and Christoph Koch, I think it was in Brooklyn a few years ago. And we went just to listen to the debate on, on the nature of consciousness. I think it ended with David Chalmers pretending to pour water on the head of Christoph Koch. <laughs> a very contentious debate, friendly actually, not that contentious. But Christoph Koch said, he's a, one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. He was the chief scientist of the Paul Allen Brain Institute at that time. Um, he said, when he went into this area of consciousness in neuroscience, all his colleagues and his superiors, his guides, professors, they told him, it's a career killer. You're going to destroy your career. And this, is, this is the worst possible area you can enter. But now you see, it's the hottest area of study. One reason, of course, is the new imaging technology. There are these fMRI scans, new kind of scanning technology which scans the brain with, and we get fine detail. So you know much more about the activity going on in the brain. So the interest in consciousness, studying consciousness through that. But also, um, another area is, of course, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, you know, tremendous development in information sciences. So that has led to an interest in consciousness. But also, it is uh, in the philosophy of mind, there's an upsurge of interest in consciousness studies, and David Chalmers is a person who single-handedly, I think is at least, if not completely, greatly responsible for this new upsurge of talk and debate uh, ab uh, about consciousness. So, consciousness studies. The hard problem of consciousness. What is this hard problem of consciousness? Um, short, like a 101, a quick introduction to that. But it's important for us to understand. We are all conscious. We are all aware. We all are, we are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. All of us are thinking right now. We're thinking, we're feeling, we understand, we remember, we desire, we hate. Uh, we wake and we dream and we sleep. Often in philosophy lectures like this, you know, all three states are present, waking, dreaming and sleep. So veritable Mandukya Upanishad is going on here. Uh, all of this is going on at the same time. I mean, uh, we are the series of experiences, what David Chalmers calls like an internal movie playing out inside us. But how is it happening? Why is this happening? How do you explain it? The, the paradigm here, yes, the, the 
the, the mainstream paradigm here is because you know in, in our world uh, everything is uh, is matter energy time space the materialist paradigm that's what we have been taught in school and that's what scientists believe that everything reality here is uh, matter energy time space and uh, so everything has to be explained in terms of matter so if we are conscious if you are aware uh, somehow it has to be explained in terms of matter that the brain and the nervous system are producing consciousness this was taken as a given nobody really doubted it i mean it was not really an area of interest though nobody really understood it also so it's only recently this this interest has become very sharp and focused how does the brain if at all the brain does produce consciousness how does it do so the point which david chalmers makes and he is not the first to make it this is a problem well known in the history of philosophy but in our time he has focused attention on it by coining this term the the phrase the hard problem of of consciousness what is this hard pro problem why is it a problem and why is it hard so it goes like this um if we scan the brain as is being done now uh, with finer and greater and greater sophistication the last thing that you will find is minute electrical activity going on in the living tissue of the brain in our in the uh, neurons in the brain is fine electrical activity going on and the idea is that somehow that activity in the brain is producing consciousness all our seeing hearing smelling tasting touching thinking remembering desiring hating uh, all our science and religion and spirituality everything is being produced by the, that tiny electrical activity in the brain uh, that's the that was the that's the idea and there's a reason for that the reason is this there is what is called a tight correlation um when we report something it hurts and uh, there's a pain and the neuroscientist will scan the brain and say that look there is this burst of electrical activity going on in a distinct region of the brain and that always lights up when you say this hurts and therefore that must be somehow connected to your feeling of hurt and so that's producing it but that's not an explanation correlation is not causation uh, there is a serious what um, philosophers call an explanatory gap uh, there's a gap in explanation what do i mean by this gap in explanation it's like this a full and thorough explanation would be like um say when a car is being produced in a factory in an assembly line the car is being produced so on one end you see the material raw material go in the parts go in and on the other end you see a car come out but the every step in the production of the car you can be you can see it you can go to the factory and take a look at the assembly line you can see how the whole thing is coming together at every step and you can see the output the car but you cannot do that you cannot do that with consciousness you can observe the brain for all you want you can observe the neurochemical activities in the brain for all you want you can observe the fine electrical activity in the neurons but from there to seeing hearing smelling tasting touching uh, thinking imagining understanding philosophizing uh, where is this you know how is it coming up how can a little burst of electricity be this vivid experience that we are all having color sound shape sensation how it's not enough to say that is it that burst of electricity is uh, consciousness it is not when you are seeing you're seeing me you're seeing this place you're thinking about it you're not feeling little jolts of electricity even if you felt it that feeling also would have to be explained so this is the explanatory gap recently i had the privilege thanks great deal to professor chakravarti of being sent back to school again you heard the harvard divinity school i didn't spend much time at the harvard divinity school but i spent a lot of time at the philosophy department in emerson hall and i took a course in the philosophy of mind so a survey uh, of and i was surprised and happy to see even the textbook taught at harvard for the philosophy of mind is edited by david chamas so a survey of the entire um, you know gamut of thought in the philosophy of mind 
and the sensation and, and the feeling I got, and I wrote this little provocative, is that I felt the last person who said something important in the philosophy of mind was Descartes 300 years ago. <laughs> There is famous cogito orgosum and so on, and the mind-body dualism which came from there. And after that, especially in the last 50 to 100 years, if you look at all the papers, all the publications, broadly speaking, they fall into two categories. One category, trying to reduce mind and consciousness into body, into brain. So what is mind, what is consciousness? It is brain or nervous activity. Or some papers will try to show that at one time it was a style in uh, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, this language philosophy, that all talk of mind and consciousness is just that. It's an illusion generated by talk. Uh, or some, like Skinner and all, would dismiss mind and consciousness altogether and try to say that it's all behavior. Whatever it is, reduction. What is consciousness? Nothing but brain. What is consciousness? Nothing but language. What is consciousness? Nothing but behavior. Who was it who said it's nothing buttery? <laughs> Professor Ch Chakravarti used the term. Nothing buttery, a kind of nothing buttery. Um, and the other group of papers all saying, sorry guys, it doesn't work. For these, these, these reasons, you are unable to reduce consciousness and mind to the brain. Um, many, uh, it's, it's sort of those who study philosophy, they all go through these papers, uh, to, to these readings. So, Consciousness, trying to explain it in terms of brain, that's one attempt in the philosophy of mind. And the other, other is to say that these attempts are not succeeding. And Thomas Nagel's What Is It Like to Be a Bat, or Mary Seeing Red for the First Time, and so many such examples. Those who study philosophy, they know of this. So that was my, my feeling, that the subject is stuck. The subject is stuck. Philosophy of mind is a subject which has stalled. Now we have the possibility of reviving that subject uh, through this new gate, the gateway of the hard problem of consciousness. So it is forcing us to rethink. Can consciousness be reduced to brain? Probably not. Now, I am saying this, many philosophers like David Chalmers and others are saying it, some people have spoken to, they are saying this, I'm sure many of the philosophers gathered here are of like mind, but there are many others, very eminent philosophers, who, are, who don't agree with this. We must acknowledge that. So, um, they will say that, no, actually, you know, um, consciousness is actually generated by the brain. I met a philosopher, uh, Massimo, he's in the Siri University of New York. So he said, I am convinced, Swami, that, the, uh, con that consciousness is generated by the living brain. Uh, how? Hard problem of consciousness, how? He said, we don't know. But give us 50 years, we will explain it. Now, this is a serious position. This is called promissory materialism. Uh, now, he, uh, he backed it up with an argument. I just, I'm giving you this as an example. This is a whole spectrum of uh, uh, arguments. An example. So he said, look. Life. Hundred years back, uh, we thought life is a divine mystery which can, we can never explain through science. But today, and, uh, Massimo is uh, not only a philosopher, he's a biologist. So he said, today we can explain the processes we call life down to the molecular level. And that for me is a good enough explanation. So what you thought could not be explained hundred years back has now been explained at great depth and detail. Uh, and exactly the same thing will happen to consciousness. We will be able to explain consciousness uh, in 30, 40, 50, 100 years. Now, I said, I immediately give a Vedantic response to it, which is, in principle, this is wrong. In principle, this is a category mistake. Why? Uh, this is the heart of the heart problem. It's not that it's, you give us more time, more technology, more grants, uh, and more research uh, students and grad students and we will solve the problem. No, it won't happen. It won't happen. It's a problem in principle. So he asked, why is it a problem in principle? It's because it's like this from a Vedantic perspective. See, you can def there's a very elegant way of defining consciousness. See, even the definition of consciousness, it's, it's vague, it's difficult to define consciousness. In the field of consciousness studies, it's ambiguous. There are multiple definitions. There are many operational definitions. A friend of mine, a monk, 
he, he told me once, this whole consciousness studies is an immature field. I said, why is it an immature field? Where you cannot, he said, you cannot define the object of your study. So <laughs> it's not yet a mature field. But in Vedanta, you have a way of defining consciousness. One way is anidam jaitanyam. Consciousness is not this. Whatever you can classify as this in our experience, this, that's not consciousness, that's an object. This table, an object. This uh, shirt, an object. This body, because you can classify it as, a, as this, it's an object. This um, thought, this thought, therefore it's an object, it's not consciousness. That to which this thought and this body and this shirt and this table are appearing, that is consciousness. So it's a very phenomenological way of pointing out what is consciousness to, to the subject. Now, I said to the gentleman, when you say life has been explained in terms of molecular processes down to the molecular processes, Vedanta has no objection to that. You have explained a complex objective phenomena in terms of more fundamental objective phenomena. But the moment you say, I will explain consciousness in terms of objective brain activity, objective phenomena, you are making a category mistake. You are jumping from something that's not an object uh, into the objective world. And so in principle, you can't do that. Of course, that already presupposes a Vedantic uh, paradigm. Was he impressed? Not the least. <laughs> I don't think it made any, any mark on him this, uh, him this uh, argument. But what did make a mark was, it's very interesting, that this was actually a bet. 25 years ago, 25 years ago, these two gentlemen, David Chalmers and Christoph Koch, had a bet. And uh, um, the bet was, Christoph Koch said, the way brain science is, pro is proceeding these days. Within 25 years, we'll be able to explain consciousness in terms of brain activity. We will reduce consciousness, we'll give a materialistic basis of consciousness. And David Chalmers says, you cannot, because it's a mistake in principle to, to think that. 25 years ago, and it, everybody, especially the two, two people who, who made the bet, they'd forgotten about the bet. Just last two months ago, somebody reminded them, 25 years have passed. So who has won the bet? Have you been able to explain consciousness in terms of brain or not? And Christoph Koch, to his credit, was the first to admit, absolutely not. We have made no progress in explaining consciousness in terms of brain activity. We have learned a lot about the brain. Neuroscience has advanced uh, a lot in the last two and a half decades. But progress towards explaining how that brain activity produces subjective experience, not at all. Not at all. And I think the terms where he had to give a case of champagne or something to... Uh, so, so finally he handed over that case uh, of uh, champagne to David Chalmers and he said, uh, Christoph Koch said, give us 25 years more. <laughs> but he, he also said he, half humorously, that's all I, I, I think I won't live more than 25 years, so I'll extend it to next 25 years. So this is the problem. You um, cannot explain brain activity in terms of consciousness. Let me approach it from another angle uh, before proceeding. AI, artificial intelligence. Now, there are these remarkable devices, these computer programs. Um, you have, all of you have heard of chat GPT and all of that. So this artificial intelligence, it can do amazing things. I asked chat GPT, write me a poem on Swami Vivekananda, and it did so. Not poet laureate material, but good enough, good enough. I mean, I don't think a schoolboy would come up with a better poem than that. But what it did next, no poet, the greatest poets on the world cannot do it. Next, I said, write another poem on Vivekananda. It immediately produced another poem. And if you keep on throughout the day asking Chad GPT to write new poems and newer poems on Vivekananda, it will keep on doing that all day long. No poet, no human poet in the world can match that. Creativity. In New York University, we were shown pictures drawn by human beings and AI and asked, can you identify which was done, done by human artists and one by AI? We could not. None of us could. Recently, I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Manhattan, the MoMA. There, modern art, Metropol Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art. There, what they have done is, they have fed the entire content of the museum. It's the most 
well endowed museum of modern art in the world. They fed the content of the entire museum to an AI and asked it to make modern art. And so when you enter that museum, you'll have this huge um, uh, you know, display, a screen, on which this AI is continuously generating art. I don't know how good an art it is, but it's hypnotic. I mean, you'll just, people are just gathered there staring at it. I stared at it. I was caught for um, a minute or two. Is it art? I don't know. Recently, a science fiction magazine stopped publishing. Why? Because they were receiving so many stories, science fiction stories, all written by AI. <laughs> it's a case, this is a magazine which had been predicting this, science fiction, you know, creative AI. And this has been like Frankenstein's monster, it came true. And first thing it destroyed was, you know, <laughs> the Asura who got the power of burning Bhasmasura to turn everything into ashes. And Shiva said, this is your power, I've given you this power. And Bhasmasura trial run beta testing, said, I, let me touch you first. <laughs> so, <laughs> like that. But it's true. The first impact, you know, it's ironic and telling. The first impact of AI is not on science. The first impact, amazingly, is on humanities. The first reaction to this chat GPT was from professors, um, uh, lecturers in the humanities departments, essays written by the students, nice assignments are being written, essays are being written by the students, all by chat GPT. <laughs> now, how do you know which the student has written by himself or herself, or it's written by a computer? You don't know. Now they have, I was talking to some young uh, lecturers, not the senior people, the people who actually grade the papers and all, you know, the TAs and all. They said now they have to introduce um, AI to detect the AI used by the students. <laughs> they were having meetings in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, among the professors in various departments, literature and uh, other humanities departments, to see what they could do. It's, it's already a crisis. It's already a crisis in humanities departments. Creativity, intelligence, memory, senses, decision making. In, in San Francisco, if you see, you will see car, self-driven car. You are driving along in a car, you will see another car coming next to you, no driver. Sometimes no passenger. Sometimes no driver but passenger. Sometimes driver is there but ha hands are off the wheel. Car is driving by itself, probably better than you. Probably better than you. Now this AI is driving a car, that means decision making, sensing, its sensors are much more powerful than any human being, it's aware of an entire area. Um, and so, now what I'm saying is, this is the point, that which we thought human beings could do, AI can do now. It can, what we thought hum, only human beings can do, creativity. After all, all other kind of physical work can be done by machines, calculators can do calculation, and so on. But creativity, painting, writing, composing, we thought this is something that only human beings can do. Nobody else can do. Well, there's news for you. The machines can do it. And better than most other, um, you know, artists or writers, except the top few maybe. Uh, so machines are already doing it. What's my point in all this? Notice in this, all this talk, one thing is left out. There is one thing that AI cannot do, ChatGPT cannot do, Google Car cannot do. One thing, only one thing, consciousness. These machines, these programs, these cars are not conscious. This is Swami, how do you know? And don't take my word for it. Ask the experts, ask the Silicon Valley engineers who have programmed these machines. Ask them, sir, are your, uh, is your ChatGPT, is your Google Car, is it conscious? And they'll say no. It's not conscious. We did not program it to be conscious. And not only that, we have no idea where to begin. We have no idea where to begin to make a program, an AI, conscious. Now, my question is this. Why not? Why not? Creativity is complex. Intelligence is complex. Sensing is complex. Decision making is complex. Consciousness is simple. Consciousness does only one thing and one thing only. It gives us first person experience, anubhava. That's all. Why can't you make the AI conscious? Why can't you make the Google car conscious? 
Not only that, not only why you cannot do, why can't you do it, why is it that you don't even have any idea where to start also? There's no idea where to start. My point here is that this shows there is a distinct difference between consciousness and the rest of it. Creative, they're connected, but there's a distinct difference. They are of different orders altogether. More of that as we go along. Um, there was this uh, professor of philosophy, Galen Strawson. It's a small world. He is the son of Sir Peter Strawson, our professor Arindam Chakravarti's guru, one of his gurus. <laughs> so Galen Strawson wrote this half humorous piece for New York Times. He said, the hard problem of matter. He said, half humorously, that there is no hard problem of consciousness. We are all conscious, we know that. And then we think somehow this consciousness is being produced by the brain, we cannot explain how, and hence hard problem of consciousness. But you've already assumed that the consciousness is being produced by the brain. Why are you assuming this? And there's some reasons for that. He said it is actually matter which is mysterious. You are conscious, I am conscious. The universe appears to us in our consciousness. So what is this universe? That is the question. And physics probes that, what is matter? And then Galen Strawson goes on to show that matter is disappearing in our front of our very eyes. You know, from um, atoms to uh, quarks to super strings or whatnot, matter is becoming more and more mysterious. Consciousness is not mysterious at all. So, here we have the hard problem of consciousness. And this is directly related to, I think, the re-emergence of spiritual themes in the modern philosophy of mind. Indian philosophy. Evan Thompson, uh, in his book, Waking, Dreaming and Being, he starts with this statement, consciousness studies is not a new discipline. It did not start at the end of the 20th century. He says, consciousness studies started 5,000 years ago in India in the texts called the Upanishads. Evan Thompson writes that. And he goes on further to say, these Upanishads are so crucial in the history of human thought that we would do well to date history, not as AD, BC, but before Upanishad and after Upanishad. So, yeah, well, you might clap. I am a teacher of Vedanta. I teach, the philosophy I teach is based on the Upanishads. I would hesitate the word, there's no real translation into English, lodja, <laughs> to, to make such, um, you know, uh, unconditional declarations. But it's coming from Shahib, so <laughs> Evan Thompson. <laughs> that's, that's perfectly all right then. Uh, from the Upanishads, from Indian philosophy. Now, I haven't started my talk yet. But uh, I promise to end in, in time. Now I'll go get into my talk. So, this, from this hard problem of consciousness, we are left with this question, what is consciousness? In Indian philosophy, what is, this view of, what is the view of consciousness? And particularly, we'll narrow it down to the Advaita Vedanta perspective of consciousness and wrap it up. Um, and why reality and reality plus, we'll wrap it up there. So very quickly. I'm going to do a TED Talk style presentation for the minutes, few minutes remaining to me. Okay. What is the Indian view of consciousness uh, then? What is, so, you know, the answer would be, you know, the question would be, okay, wise guy, you've got our attention. Now, what's the answer? There is no one answer from Indian philosophy. One and one would be uh, suspicious if there was a very neat solution offered by Indian philosophy. There is a whole range of uh, answers given by different Indian philosophers. Just as a very quick sampling, let me take up five, uh, five broad approaches to consciousness in Indian philosophy. And by the way, this is just something I heard from a monk in Uttarakhand who said all of this, what I'm going to say now for the next 15 minutes, he said all of this in, um, uh, in two sentences, basically. <laughs> so, five broad approaches to philosophy, uh, to this problem of consciousness, hard problem of consciousness in Indian philosophy. What is the relationship between the object and consciousness? Brain is an object. So, what relationship is there? One uh, approach is, the first approach is, 
the object generates consciousness. Object generates consciousness. Brain is generating consciousness. This is the Charvaka, the naturalist in uh, Professor Chakravarti's talk. The Charvaka says, Pan, this is also untranslatable. Chewing beetle rolls in a tick, that's not quite right. Pan, when you chew a pan, there is no red color in any of the ingredients. In the your tongue becomes red. And the Charvaka says, there is no consciousness in the object. However, when the objects interact in a certain way, let us say in this body, let us say, they don't talk about the brain, but let us say in this brain and nervous system, when the objects interact in certain way, they produce something which was not there earlier, and that is consciousness. So that is uh, one approach, the Charvaka approach. And there, the hard problem of consciousness hits hard. Uh, because you cannot explain uh, something entirely subjective in terms of objective processes. This is what we were discussing till now, the hard problem of consciousness. The Charvaka view does not stand, and so the same thing comes down to today. Most of the scientists and philosophers opposed to this idea of consciousness as a fundamental reality, they would fall under this reductive Charvaka view. They try to say, somehow, try to um, say that the brain is producing, somehow producing consciousness, promissory materialism and things like that. So that doesn't work. The second approach in uh, Indian philosophy is the opposite. Consciousness generates the object. Consciousness generates this material universe, including body and mind and everything. Um, who says that? Every theistic religion says that. Any kind of theistic philosophy. Theism, Ishwar Bisha Shijara. What do they say? One common um, feature of all theistic religions is that God is the creator. God has created this universe. And God has created all of us and this entire universe. Now if you ask your God, is this God a conscious God and unconscious God? You'll feel insulted. Of course it's a conscious God. So consciousness has created matter. This is the... Uh, second approach and many many philosophers in some ways Brahma Sutra you know uh, what is Brahman Janmadhyasya Yataha Asya Jagata Janmastiti Bhanga Yasma Tad Brahma that is that ultimate reality from which the entire universe has emerged so from your pure consciousness this entire universe has emerged a kind of theistic interpretation of that the problem there again is I mean these are I'm moving with very broad strokes. This is just a broad picture. The problem there would be um, atheism, agnosticism. The problem with God is, God is great, magnificent, if God exists. So the if God exists, that's the problem. <laughs> you can doubt, and people have doubted from ancient times till today, and the number of doubters of the existence of God is the maximum today. Somebody said, in no time in all of history have so many doubted the existence of the deity to such an extent. Uh, so, doubt about the existence of God, that is the problem with the second approach, one of the problems. Alan Watts, not well known in uh, India, but he is quite well known in the United States, he was a British philosopher. Somebody put him this, this way. He was part philosopher, part pirate. <laughs> he operated in the uh, Bay Area near San Francisco in the 1950s and 60s. So he said, if you separate God and the world, he calls it a crackpot theory. The idea of, you know, there is a reality which is called clay. So there is a clay and there is a pot. If you do that, then you end up with a crackpot theory. <laughs> You will end up chasing this idea, where is God? This question will keep on uh, haunting you. The third approach to this in Indian philosophy is uh, consciousness and object are not that one has created the other. They are parallel realities. They are parallel realities. Consciousness exists, objects exist, universe exists, and a fundamental reality called consciousness exists. Immediately you will say, oh, Sankhya, Sankhya. Not just Sankhya, David Chalmers. So if you ask David Chalmers, so what is the solution to the hard problem of consciousness? He will say the solution is this, that you have to accept probably, he says you will have to probably accept that consciousness is a fundamental reality, it cannot be reduced to brain processes. In this universe, time, space, matter, energy, and consciousness. 
So consciousness is a fundamental reality, not to be reduced to some material basis. This uh, he calls, it's an old theory in uh, Western philosophy also, called panpsychism. Panpsychism. That mind and consciousness are sort of all pervasive, ubiquitous. Some, of course, it's not widely accepted, but this is, this is you're inevitably pushed to this, um, uh, to this conclusion. In fact, yeah, there was an interview when they asked David Chalmers about his belief in pan panpsychism. He said, if you think long and hard enough about the hard problem of consciousness, then you either become a panpsychist or you go into administration. <laughs> so, panpsychism today and Kapila Sankhya, Purusha and Prakriti, consciousness and matter. Vivekananda said that is the oldest human philosophy. Kapila was the first philosopher of the human race. So, that's one option. Patanjali Yoga, um, Sankhya, uh, consciousness and matter are fundamental realities and they interact. Where do they interact? In us. We are all interactions of consciousness and matter. The whole brunt of Professor Chakravarti's talk was, you know, the spirit and the natural side of the human being, the body, and the, so the interaction of that. There is a, just for the sake of sampling, a fourth approach to all of this. Take the Buddhistic approach, and one of the Buddhistic schools, the Madhyamaka, the emptiness people, Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, great names from the very ancient Hori past. So they, they will say, no, 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 no. Both consciousness and object, consciousness and this entire universe, both are empty. Sarvam shunyam. Chandrakirti uses uh, the very telling example of two sheaves of hay leaning against each other. If you remove one, the other will fall. No Vedantin will use this example. Chandrakirti uses this. If you remove the object, where is consciousness? In deep sleep. Nothing is experienced. And where is the experience in consciousness? It's not there. It says, Swami, you have been telling us so many years that you are, you slept happily, you are the witness of the absence of all objects. But Chandrakirti, Nagarjuna, they would not be impressed by that argument. They would say, this is back calculation. You have woken up and then you are saying, there, is, there was some consciousness uh, experiencing the absence. No, no object, no consciousness. Both rise and fall together. Finally, the Advaita point of view is that the object is an appearance in consciousness. The object appears to consciousness, in consciousness, and is nothing but consciousness. So consciousness itself is appearing as its own object. One sadhu monk, he put it so simply and beautifully. What is the nature of the eye? It is to see. Now when the eyes look up into space, it, can't, it doesn't see space, it sees the sky, the child sees the sky as an inverted bowl. So you are seeing a surface where there is no surface, because the eye, the nature of the eye is to see. And he says exactly like that, the nature of consciousness is to experience. But there is nothing else to experience. Consciousness alone is. So it experiences itself as its own object. So that's the Advaita Vedanta perspective. Now in the last few minutes remaining to me, I will sketch a pathway. In, I promise to finish in time. I'll sketch a pathway from our present uh, scientific mainstream perspective to the Advaita Vedanta perspective. And this will be done in five steps, five negations. Each of these negations does a huge amount of philosophical heavy lifting. You can, not only us, but philosophers have fought over this for thousands of years, both in the East and the West. Each step is a dramatic step, a dramatic negation, and there are uh, huge philosophical controversies. But I'll just outline this path. What is the path? Where are we going? From our present understanding, scientific materialism, materialistic reductive understanding, or lack of understanding, to the Advaitic perspective in five negations. Step one, consciousness is not brain. Step two, consciousness is not mind. Step three, consciousness is not an object. Step four, Consciousness is not many, and finally, consciousness is not two, Advaitam, non-dual. Five steps. First, consciousness is not brain. All that we, I said till now, all the discussion on the hard problem of consciousness is this first step. And I'm so glad that we are living in a time when this first step is being, if not taken, at least is being seriously proposed. 
Until 20, 25 years ago, people refused to talk about consciousness in the scientific community. And now they are taking it very seriously. And even the possibility that maybe consciousness is not the brain. It's not just David Chalmers. Uh, there is uh, Donald Hoffman, Bernardo Karstrup, and many others. Philip Goff, uh, many others who um, hold similar views. So the first step is not just an Advaita Vedanta perspective. I wonder if I can say this. He mentioned a dialogue with Deepak Chopra. Now, I can see some people rolling their eyes, but anyway, he's a good guy. <laughs> now, there's a difference between a stage persona and in the green room. So in the green room, when we are speaking, he said, Swamiji, these people, by which he meant these people. So they're, they're taking our views and not giving credit to it. Uh, you know, Vedanta, Sankhya views, and not giving credit, enough credit to us. I said, Deepak Ji, that's great. That's really great. If somebody who is not some, a spiritual seeker, who is not interested in Indian philosophy, who is a neuroscientist, or a philosopher of mind in NYU, coming entirely from an agnostic perspective, coming entirely from a materialistic reductive perspective, is forced to the conclusion that consciousness cannot be reduced to a material basis, that's much better than somebody saying, oh, I read it in the Upanishads, or I heard it from my Lama or something, and this is the... No, no, no. So it's much better that way. Consciousness is not the brain. This is step one. Still, a lot of argument, a lot of work to be done on this. But we must go further now. We cannot stay here. We must go further. Consciousness is not the mind. And this follows from phenomenologically. We can see ourselves right now. We have defined consciousness as not this. If you can use this, then it's not consciousness. Can you say this thought this idea, this memory, of course you can say that. And therefore, our, the contents of our minds, our minds are not consciousness by themselves. So this distinction between mind and consciousness is not clear in the modern philosophy of mind. Uh, when I was doing the readings in the philosophy of mind, I saw a number of tangles which can be easily untangled if this distinction between mind and consciousness is maintained. And this distinction between mind and consciousness was a staple in Indian philosophy. For thousands of years, almost every school made a clear distinction between mind and consciousness. Between consciousness and its contents, not just perceptions, the world outside, but thoughts. Generally, in the philosophy of mind, mind and consciousness are taken together, in the modern philosophy of mind. Consciousness is not mind. Step, th step three. Then what is consciousness? If it's not the world, if it's not the body, if it's not this, then what is consciousness? Consciousness is not an object. This is another even more dramatic step forward. The reason why people are finding it very difficult, scientists and philosophers, to deal with consciousness is because of this very elusive nature of consciousness. One very famous philosopher said consciousness is transparent. But in that very language, consciousness is transparent, is still the seed of the idea, it's some kind of object. You know, like, you can't look through a wall, but you can look through glass. Glass is transparent. Consciousness is transparent. It's not like that also. It's not an object. Hume, David Hume, he said, what is this self people talk about? When I experience my uh, inner states, I find perceptions, I find judgments, um, memories. But there is no sense of I. What, what corresponds to that sense of I? I don't find a self. And Vedanta would say here is, Dear David Hume, you are looking in the wrong place. You are trying to find the self as an object. That's why you can't find it. You cannot find it, not because it doesn't exist. It's because you are looking in the wrong place. The one which is looking is the self. This idea that there can be something that is not an object, this is not easily accepted, uh, mainly because we live in a very uh, scientific world, a world where objective is equal to real. Uh, Vedanta reverses it. Subject is the reality to which the uh, object appears. I think um, Galen Strawson would <laughs> agree to that. So it's not an object. Consciousness is not an object. It's, an, it's that to which all objects appear. Further, now we are going to go even further. We are going to take leave of... Sankhya also. How many consciousnesses? 
There is consciousness, uh, does it have a plural or not? And Advaita Vedanta would say, and the Gita Krishna says, Kshetragyam Chapimam Vidhi Sarvakshetre Shubharata. In all these fields, there is but one knower of the field, and I am that. In all these material beings, there is one consciousness, one knower, one experiencer, uh, one consciousness. So consciousness is not many. And here we are parting ways with multiple Indian philosophies. Multiple Indian philosophies. Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Purva Mimamsa. Uh, we are parting ways. Multiple schools of Buddhism is saying consciousness is one. And there are many arguments and counter-arguments to this. And finally, here is the dramatic reversal. Where what we have noticed, we have excluded everything from consci consciousness. World is not consciousness, the body is not consciousness, sensations and thoughts are not consciousness. There are not many consciousnesses. We have excluded everything. In the final step, it's reversed. Everything is taken back into consciousness. Consciousness is not two. That which is other than, seems to be other than consciousness is nothing but consciousness itself. That's why non-dual, advaitam. Everything is appearing to consciousness, but you know, Swami Brahmananda said, well, can you show me the line dividing consciousness and the world? You'll actually find no line dividing consciousness and the world, even phenomenologically. The entire universe is appearing in consciousness. That which is appearing in consciousness and cannot be expressed as other than consciousness, it must be somehow consciousness itself. So this entire universe is uh, an appearance in consciousness, consciousness real, universe appearance, and that's where Advaita, classical Advaita Vedanta stops. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya. What am I? Real or an appearance? You are real. You are consciousness itself. As consciousness, you are the reality to which the world, body, mind are all appearances. So this is the non-dual nature of consciousness. Five negations. Consciousness is not brain, not mind, not object, not many, not two. One last word and I'm, I'm done. The subject of this uh, talk, uh, reality and reality plus. So reality plus is the name of David Chalmers' latest book. What he has done there is, he says, this virtual world we have created. You have phones, social media, um, then there is simulations, all of that. And we have this world where we are sitting. They are seamlessly working together. We are creating this virtual world right now. now what is it called? Meta. So all of these things are there now. He says now, we have these two worlds, my real world and that virtual world. And he says, why? Consider that also as real. That's an extended reality, uh, reality plus. And that's the theme of his book. He calls it techno-philosophy. Basically what he has done is taken up these old questions of philosophy. What is real? How do we know? What's the point of it all? And it, it examines it in terms of the new technology of virtual reality and AI and all. And comes up with very in interesting observations. But what I'm taking away from that is this. Notice how he collapsed, he synthesized these two worlds, real world, virtual world, into one world. And he calls it reality plus. We are living in reality plus. In Advaita Vedanta, it struck me, you still, there's a tension. Consciousness and appearance. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya. This is realization. You have come to reality when you realize the non-dual consciousness. But there's also the counterpart to it, the falsity, the appearance. That falsity, this world appearance, body, universe, our activities in the world, these are also nothing but Brahman. Brahman alone, consciousness alone is appearing in all of these ways instead of regarding it as appearance. If you regard consciousness, Brahman as the reality, you regard consciousness world as reality plus. So this is you, the consciousness, non-dual consciousness, experiencing reality plus. Or in Sri Ramakrishna's language, popularized, Huh? Vigyana, yes, somebody was saying by Swami Medhananda, the Vigyana version of non-dualism. Brahman is real, consciousness is real, there is a whole realm of appearance to consciousness, but consciousness appearance together, nothing other than consciousness, what Sri Ramakrishna called Brahma Shakti, the idea of Vigyana, can we call it reality plus. 
what David Chalmers has done is he has merged the the Vyavaha, I'm using Vedantic terms now, Vyavaharika and Pratibhasika, and is calling it Reality Plus. Can we merge Pratibhasika, Vyavaharika, and with the, in the ground with uh, uh, the Paramarthika, and you call that Reality Plus. So, Tattvam Asi, you are that, would mean you are that Reality Plus. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you very much. Yes.